Welcome. Thank you all for tuning in this evening. My name is Haley Walker and I'm the Communications Director here at the Freshwater Trust. I'm happy to be able to play MC for this event tonight and to introduce you all to some of the incredible work and the people who've been doing this work for now now more than a decade in the Sandy River Basin. Just a little bit of background for you all on TFT. Our formal mission is to preserve and restore freshwater ecosystems. We were actually founded in 1983 as Oregon Trout, which was the first wild fish conservation group here in the Pacific Northwest. And over the past about 37 years, our work has greatly expanded into new geographies, including California, Idaho, Washington as well. Now, in addition to geography, the nature of our work has also adapted with time. Uh, today, we believe that only through strategic action and a laser focus on results can we really match the scale of the freshwater problems in our country on a timeline that matters. And speaking of outcomes, we are really fortunate to have the folks with us here to talk through some of what we've achieved together in the Sandy. Let me just go ahead and introduce you to them. We have Bruce Zolik and Matt D'Angelo with the U.S. Forest Service here, and we also have Mark McAllister and Daniel Baldwin with the Freshwater Trust. Before we dive into what they have to say, we just wanted to share a little quick video with you all that really sets the stage and provides a little context about our work here in the Sandy. So Caroline, can you take that away? The Sandy River Basin starts at the very tip of Mount Hood, the very highest peak in Oregon, and tumbles down through Sandy and out towards Troutdale, where its mouth meets the Columbia River. Following the 64 flood to reduce flood risks, the Corps of Engineers and other government entities came into the Sandy River and diked the floodplains and took large wooden boulders out of the river. The thinking at the time was, the quicker you could get water off the mountain, the less flood risk there'll be. That had detrimental impacts to flooding, and it also had really bad impacts to fish and fish habitat. So the Sand River Basin Partners formed in 1999. They came together, comprised about a dozen different groups with one shared objective, and that's to restore habitat to benefit salmon and steelhead. Today we were using a helicopter to deliver large wood. The wood is what holds the rivers together. And without that wood, they start incising and they get more and more degraded. One of the things people don't appreciate when they go out into rivers is how abundant wood have been in the past and how important it is to fish and fish habitat. It is the large wood that knits everything together to create those scour holes, to create that pool tail out, to slow down that river so that gravel can be deposited for those fish to be laying their eggs in. We're actively putting wood back into the streams. During a super tight in-water work window, we have over 2,000 pieces of wood going into these rivers to restore them. 
It's large wood that's kegged up in there that really creates nooks and crannies that juvenile salmon steelhead rely on to complete their life history. So we'll do a restoration project, put water back onto the floodplain, and immediately we'll have juvenile coho in there. September, October, instantly we'll have spring chinook spawning on the gravels that we created. Further into the fall in November, we'll have coho spawning where water has not been on the floodplain for over 50 years. Fish always tell us if we've done a good job. We have set up Still Creek to let the natural processes take over. Being done with Still Creek is a big deal because it confirms that we're on the right track. It is something that provides momentum to continue work in the Sandy Basin. Awesome. Thank you all for bearing with us there. You had to watch a, a minute or two of the video over again. Apologies for that, but I'm really excited to pass the mic over to Mark McAllister. Mark is the Habitat Restoration Director here at the Freshwater Trust. I also really want to encourage you all to submit questions into the question and answer section of the webinar. We will have a whole Q&A after the presentation. Um, so encourage you to do that throughout the extent of the presentation. And Mark, the mic is all yours. Thanks, Haley, and thanks everybody for joining. Um, Sandy salmon and steelhead are listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act, and the loss or degradation of habitat is a primary factor in their status. In response to fish declines and Portland General Electric's decision to remove two dams in the Sandy Basin, the Sandy River Basin Partners formed to restore habitat to benefit salmon and steelhead in the Sandy. This picture is of the Salmon River in Wildwood, and like many sections in the river, um, you go out to the Sandy Basin and you think it looks great, and it does look great. However, a deeper look shows that the river is still negatively impacted by two past landscapes state scale disturbances. Next slide. The two primary drivers of degraded habitat conditions are basin scale clear-cut logging and responses to previous flood events. Extensive clear-cut logging occurred in the Upper Sandy from the early 1900s to the 1970s. In large areas, logging cleared nearly every tree along miles of the stream. Large trees and jams were removed from the stream channel as well. The second driver was our response to large floods, particularly the 64 flood on Sandy, which is the flood of record. The belief at the time was that the quicker you get water off the mountain, the less flood risk and less uh, damage will be to uh, downstream landowners. To this end, the river was straightened and diked and large wood was removed from the river corridor. These actions though, eliminated the processes that are required to create the habitat conditions needed for abundant salmon and steelhead. Without in-stream roughness, Rivers downcut and become disconnected from floodplains and off-channel habitat. The picture on the right that you're looking at shows bulldozers on the upper Sandy following the 1964 flood. And then the picture on the left shows the resulting simplified stream channel. Next picture. This image is of the same reach, but shows an aerial view, which really allows the viewer to see the straightened river segments. This is not the way a natural river is supposed to look. Next slide. To inform our restoration work, the partners developed a restoration strategy for the Sandy and prioritized sub-watersheds based on current strongholds of fish. 
The highest ranking set watersheds and where we are currently working include the Upper Sandy and Salmon River. Streams here and clear streams here include Clear Fork, Zigzag River, Still Creek, the Salmon River, and Salmon River tributaries, including the South Fork Salmon, Sixes Creek, and Boulder Creek. Our approach is to identify current habitat conditions and reference or historic habitat conditions. Then the difference between these become our restoration targets. In this picture, you can see Spring Chinook holding on the Lower Salmon River, and this image was taken a couple weeks ago, right below one of our main project reaches. Bruce will now go into limiting factors and the restoration approaches we use. Thanks, Mark. Could I have the next slide? To address the impacts and simplification of streams and river channels in the Sandy Basin, we have used a natural river design approach to restoring complexity to stream channels. We build wood jams that emulate how stable wood jam, wood accumulations naturally form in river channels. And we have also added back boulders and wood to channels to reduce the steepness of the channel and the incision of the channel from those past disturbances and this by thereby increasing floodplain connectivity. And we do this in a way that both adding the boulders to the riffles emulates the natural processes that were there and the wood in the channel emulates the wood that would have naturally been there. By adding large wood in this way and, at, and replacing boulders and riffle and pool tailouts, we restore river processes and maintain that maintain complex fish habitat through time. By occupying the channel with wood jams, the river is no longer able to quickly run down the valley and off the mountain. It has to find its way around the wood jams. As a result, water surface elevations are raised and floodplain connections are increased. River velocities are slowed and gravels are deposited upstream and downstream of the wood jams. Pool habitat is formed by flood flows scouring pools against the face of the wood jams and in side channels where wood jams split the river flows, helping to increase side channel connectivity. These actions address limiting factors to fish production in many of the rivers in the upper Sandy Basin. And those include limited amount of side channel or off channel habitat for juvenile fish to rear in and adult fish to spawn in, particularly coho salmon and also a lack of pool or slow water habitats for both juvenile rearing and adult fish to hold in prior to spawning, and a lack of spawning gravel with the size of gravels needed by salmon and steelhead to lay their eggs in. Next slide. At low flow, as shown on the photo here on the left side, it's, it seems like a pretty simple thing to add wood to a river channel. But in the photo on the right is the Salmon River on the same section of the river at a three to five year flood stage. And it shows that adding complexity to large rivers is a pretty daunting task. There's a lot of energy in that river. And to do this successfully, you need a great team of hydrologists, hydraulic engineers, and fish biologists. Next slide. Here's an example of a constructed wood jam that emulates the natural wood jam that would form at a point of a bar or an island. Next slide. And here's an aerial view of a wood jam that was constructed on a bar on the Salmon River that shows the restoration of river functions by adding wood to the channel. Formerly, wood in, in transport during flood flows was just leaving the river. By constructing this jam, we have now holding onto that wood and it's being trapped and held onto that wood jam. The area of this jam has increased almost seven times in size from the original about 25 square meter size jam to over 150 square meters of wood that have been recruited onto the jam during flood flows. Similarly, the amount of gravel area upstream of the jam has increased two to three times. So we have been doing these kind of restoration actions on multiple streams and rivers in the upper Sandy Basin, including the Clear Fork of the Sandy River, Clear Bloss Creek, Zigzag River, Still Creek, the Salmon River, and several of its tributaries. But today we'll talk further in depth on three streams of 
uh, that we've been working on, the Salmon River, Still Creek, and the Zigzag River. Next slide. I'll start out with the Salmon River. We have implemented restoration actions over the last decade on three miles of the Salmon River. This is an aerial view of two different side channel takeoffs where we've constructed wood jams that have reconnected side channel habitat and off channel and flood plains. To date, we have constructed over 40 main channel jams through the addition of over 2000 pieces of large wood, trees and logs. Next slide, please. Here's an example of two wood jams constructed on an outside meander of the Salmon River. And again, here's the river at a seven year flood stage. So it's a dynamic river and, and wood is interacting with it at multiple flows. In addition to the main channel jams, we've built another 30 jams in side channels. And through this, we've, we've reconnected 50 acres of floodplain habitat and 15 acres of off channel habitat. Next slide. Here's a site, uh, wood jam that was constructed to reconnect river flows to over a three quarter mile along side channel. And that side channel takes off on the right side of the wood jam as you're looking upstream. And we've gone, we've re reconnected over three miles of side channel on the lower three miles of Salmon River. When we started work, there was only a 10th of a mile side channel per mile of river channel. And now we have a mile of river side channel per mile of main channel. So almost a tenfold increase in side channel habitat. Next slide. This slide shows gravel patches that were present on about a quarter mile long reach of the Salmon River prior to restoration on the left side. There was only one patch present. After the construction of eight wood jams and connectivity of two side channels, the amount of gravel increased greatly on this quarter mile reach. It was a five time, five fold increase in gravel availability from about 50 square meters of gravel available prior to restoration to greater than 250 square meters after construction of the wood jams. And the total number, the number of patches increased from one, just one patch prior to restoration to 13 distinct patches on this reach. So again, that's an example of process-based restoration where adding wood to and complexity back to the channel results in creation of quality fish habitat. Next, uh, Daniel will talk a little bit about Still Creek. Thanks, Bruce. Um, yeah, I'm going to present on Still Creek uh, for you guys. And this is a work, uh, a watershed that the Freshwater Trust has been working in uh, since 2012. Um, and we're really excited about it because it's really a good example of um, really a, a case where we're able to come in and work at a watershed scale and sort of walk away from it and hopefully close out and let it really function on its own. Um, and so for folks who are unfamiliar with the basin, uh, Still Creek is a tributary of the Zigzag River, which flows into the Sandy um, near Rhododendron. Um, and it's a really important place because it's been identified as anchor habitat uh, for all three threatened populations of anadromous fish in the Sandy Basin. So in Still Creek, we have Spring Chinook, Coho, and Winter Steelhead. Um, so it was a really high priority watershed for us to start working in uh, pretty early on. And Still Creek has been impacted by a lot of the same uh, modifiers that Mark was talking about earlier. So this stream had a lot of its in-channel roughness removed. You know, there was wood and boulders taken out of the channel. In addition to that, most of the side channels in the system were disconnected from the main stem. So the pre-project sort of conditions had, you know, a really sort of simple, straight, over steepened channel, um, which was really lacking in terms of the amount of complexity it could support and the amount of fish that it could support. Uh, next slide, please. And so when we're throwing around words like flipping connection or, or complexity or side channels, you know, this is sort of a map view of, of what we're talking about. So uh, the map on the left is showing you an example of about a half mile of project work that went in between 2013 and 2017. Um, and I, you know, if you kind of look at the center of that map, there's a really sort of thick main channel that's going through there. And that would have been really the, the only wetted conditions that were present before we were able to do, start doing work on this reach. Um, and now in our post-project kind of conditions, um, all those little smaller blue lines are essentially just showing you 
um, side channels that were either reconnected um, from removing some of those historic berms or actually being constructed as um, sort of high flow refuge for fish. And the conditions that we have now are really a, a stream that's able to access its floodplain through a lot of different smaller hydraulic features. Um, so now, you know, whenever we have a seasonal flood, um, the river is able to disperse that energy out into its floodplain um, into smaller channels where fish can, um, you know, sort of take refuge and, and survive the winter because that's a really big throttling effect, uh, effect for uh, juvenile fish and it really affects their survival rates. Uh, next slide, please. And this is showing uh, kind of what, what that burn removal looks like on the ground. So uh, this, these pair of photos are showing uh, before and after conditions of our work from 2017 uh, in the pumpkin patch reach of Still Creek, which is about halfway up the watershed. And I kind of want to call your attention to that little crooked tree um, that's in the same two photos. It's right under where it says before and after. And you can kind of see it's the only feature that really stays constant uh, between these two photos. Um, and what we've done here is we've 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 dug through this berm, which is actually, it's a pretty gigantic feature. And at this point, it's um, been overgrown with vegetation. You'd really have to get an eye for these sort of things uh, to see where they are. Um, and it really would have taken just a catastrophic flow for the stream to be able to access the floodplain on the other side of that thing. So by just um, sort of plugging holes through the, these berms in um, really opportunistic places, you know, with a minimal amount of work, we're sort of able to mostly just unbreak the river instead of, you know, constructing these specific features. Um, and by targeting our approach effectively, you know, we're really able to access a lot more of that floodplain with a lot less work. Uh, and next slide, please. And getting at some of the processes that Bruce was talking about, um, this is an example of a project reach that we put in in 2015 that's had, you know, five years for the river to start to reach a new equilibrium. Um, so in these two photos, I want you to look at the, uh, the channel bed composition. In 2015, you can see that it's mostly kind of cobble sized or like basketball sized um, substrate, uh, which fish really can't move around and they're not going to spawn in it. It's not really functioning as habitat. But by coming in and sort of regrading that stream and adding new roughness elements to it, um, we're really able to get it to a place where it will start to recruit those gravels naturally that fish spawn in. Uh, so if you look in the 2020 photo, you know, you can see that the bed has really fined up really dramatically uh, in just a short number of years. Uh, next slide. And so this is just kind of showing you what all that work amounts to. You know, we've done a lot of work in Still Creek over a number of years and thousands of pieces of wood in here and, you know, hundreds of log jams. And we've really been able to restore a dramatic amount of, uh, of ecological function to this watershed in a way that we're really proud of. And our hope now is that we can sort of walk away and just monitor it through time. And, you know, hopefully this river will now be able to uh, function on its own without people needing to mess with it. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to Matt, who's going to talk about some of our work that's planned and the one recently on the Zigzag River. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so I'm here to talk about work that we performed in 2019 and 2020 on the Zigzag River, which is one of the really major tributaries to the upper sandy watershed. Um, so the Zigzag is actually a really heavily impacted river, um, even compared to some of the other rivers we've been talking about. It's in close proximity to Highway 26 and uh, flows through the town of Rhododendron and there's a bunch of summer homes in the area. And so the Corps of Engineers really, really focused on trying to control the river here, um, you know, by building berms and removing large wood, just like we talked about. Uh, however, we've learned that this type of control is bad for floods and also bad for fish. And so our work on the zigzag is really primarily focused on removing those berm structures. So the imagery that you're seeing right here is drone imagery uh, from just one part of our 2019-2020 project, just one site. Um, and you're seeing the main stem of the river and then uh, one of the side channels coming off on the right side of the river and going off to the floodplain. Uh, so that's just kind of an image of what it looks like from the air when we remove uh, that firm material. Uh, next slide. So before we do a project like this, um, we start by modeling to try to figure out how we can kind of get the best impact, um, you know, the most bang for our, for our buck. And so kind of as Daniel was talking about before, uh, we try to kind of uh, identify key locations where we can remove berm material and activate a ton of floodplain. Um, so the figure on the left um, shows the floodplain of the zigzag uh, restoration site before, um, before restoration. Uh, and this is showing uh, the results of a hydraulic model uh, during a biennial flood event. So that's a flood event that happens roughly once every two years. 
Um, so when there was uh, summer low flow, there was actually no water on the floodplain. And then at a biennial flood event like this, we really were just kind of barely getting a little bit of water onto the floodplain. Um, however, what that model does show us is also some channels that show up. When the, when the river does finally spill its banks, um, it shows us where it naturally wants to go. So based off of this model, we were able to select uh, six different sites where we could remove berm material strategically um, and then see what would happen. So before we did that in the field, we did another model where we, we removed berm material in those sites and then um, ran the model at the same flood event. And what you can see is just a tremendous increase in the amount of floodplain that's activated. Um, so yeah, not only do we have uh, water in the river at summer low flows now, we have it um, across the entire floodplain during, uh, during winter events. Uh, next slide. So this is that same restoration site, um, but on the ground, what it looks like. Um, so this is one of those six sites that I mentioned where we removed berm material um, and then excavated just a little bit of a channel, um, sending water out into the floodplain um, and just deep enough so that we have water there year round. So this picture that you're looking at here actually shows um, the side channel only about four, uh, four hours after it was opened up. So it looks pretty good for being just built. Uh, next slide. And so this is actually that exact same site, but just looking left a little ways. Um, and so this is to show you that it's not just about removing the berm and sending water onto the floodplain. In order to do that, um, we also have to do some work in the main channel. So it might not look like we did much here, but if you look at that sunny area, um, just kind of behind the, the log jam that you see, that's actually a ripple that we constructed. So we took a bunch of the berm material um, and we actually put some of it into the main stem of the river to raise the elevation. And so what that, that does is it kind of backs the water up a little bit. It kind of matches out the floodplain in the main channel a little bit better. And then it really helps to kind of maintain that new side channel that we built. Um, so all in all, in the end of this project, we ended up removing over 1,900 900 cubic yards of firm material. Um, we reactivated over 2,200 feet of side channel and we reactivated 12 acres of floodplain. Uh, next slide. And so just, this is my last slide, just to finish out, I wanted to show um, two spawning Chinook salmon. So you have the male on the top and the female on the bottom. You can tell because her tail's all beat up and she's been building her, uh, her red. So they're sitting on their nest. Um, and the reason I show this picture is just to kind of bring it back to why we're doing all this work and why we're sending water out of the floodplain, why we're spending all this money. Um, so this is actually from, uh, not the zigzag, but our Clear Fork restoration site. But three weeks after we did restoration work this year, we had spawning Chinook right where we placed some large wood. Um, so yeah, this is what it's all about, getting more healthy runs of wild fish. So now I'm going to send it back to Daniel. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Matt. So uh, I'm gonna split the section with Bruce a bit and talk about some of the results that we've seen um, from our monitoring and some of our modeling um, throughout the Sandy River Basin. Um, and so one of the ways that the Freshwater Trust tries to quantify something as kind of fuzzy and weird as an idea of like complexity or ecosystem function is by using the stream functional assessment model. Um, and this is an EPA tool that was developed to take into account things like local hydrology and uh, landscape dynamics and sediment composition and uh, large wood and roughness and side channels and really tried to distill that down into, okay, well, how much of this habitat is actually being utilized by fish before and after? So this is a little bit different than just say like measuring the scope of your project and saying that, you know, we worked along X miles of stream. Uh, what this is saying is the amount of habitat that's available to fish that wouldn't have been available beforehand. So this is sort of new habitat, if you will, that we've been able to, to quantify in a really kind of um, honest and open way um, about the work that we're doing. And this comes straight from some of our construction metrics and um, some of our long-term monitoring, just looking at, um, you know, metrics on the ground, like, like the, the um, substrate composition, uh, channel features, and, um, you know, the density of those different features and, and how different they are from each other. Um, but I think what people get really excited about is, is the fish. Uh, so Bruce is going to chat a little bit more about some of those really exciting results that we've seen pretty recently uh, throughout the basin. Thanks, Daniel. Um, so we have accomplished a lot of habitat restoration work, but the big question is, what do the fish think about it? Well, the short answer is the salmon and steelhead are just ex as excited about the work as we are. Here's a picture of spring chinook spawning in the salmon 
Sandy River, tributary to the Salmon. I mean, Salmon River, tributary to the Sandy. In the last six years, the number of Chinook returning to the restoration reach on the lower Salmon River has been more than 150% of the long-term average. And that works out to about 32 to 35 reds per mile. And the red is the term for where a female lays her eggs in the, in the gravels of the red river. In two of the last four years, we've had 70 reds per mile or three and a half times the long-term average number of fish spawning in the lower salmon. Next slide. Similarly, the number of steelhead spawning on the restored reaches of the Salmon River has greatly increased. And this figure on the left side shows the number of reds found on a, about a quarter mile long restoration reach for the three years previous to restoration. And on the right side, the figure shows the number of reds during the three years following restoration and the addition of eight large wood jams. And the number of steelhead spawning in this reach has increased significantly. The average increased from five reds a year to 21 reds per year. And if you look at basin returns, you're seeing a, we're seeing a similar response. In the steelhead returns to the basin as a whole, two of the last six years over about 6,000 adults have returned to the Sandy Basin. And that compares to the long-term average of about 1,000 fish prior to restoration efforts and removal of the Marmot Dam in 2007. Um, next slide. The number of coho using the restored side channels is also significantly increased through time. And next slide. And in this graphic, you can see that we've actually increased freshwater production in two of our banner watersheds, Still Creek and Salmon River. The number of Steel smolts, which are juvenile salmon or steelhead that have reared in the freshwater for one to two years and are now ready to go to the ocean to get big. Well, those number of smolts have increased eight to 10 times over the eight year time period in this Still Creek and Salmon River for steelhead. And the number of coho smolts have almost doubled during, or more than doubled during that time period. So this is really exciting to us because it shows that we're not just concentrating fish in our restoration reaches, but that it shows that fish are actually surviving better and producing more juveniles through time. So now I'll turn it over to Mark. He'll talk about some of the ancillary results of doing restoration in the basin too. Thanks, Bruce. In addition to benefiting fish, project actions, have you, as you've heard, are designed to restore stream processes, so not only is high quality habitat self-sustaining in the future, but riparian and wildlife communities benefit as well. Additionally, the Pacific Northwest is expected to see increases in peak winter flood flows and more rain in the winter and spring in response to climate change. Project actions that restore natural river processes and riparian functions are anticipated to disperse flood flows and lessen downstream flood risk. And finally, as the slide says, since 2008, we've spent nearly $7 million on restoration work in the Sandy. The bulk of these funds going into the local economy for services, including services like heavy equipment operators. And this picture is typical of a heavy lift helicopter that we use to place wood in stream channels. Back to you, Haley. Awesome. Wow, you guys are uh, really pitching some questions our way. Um, hopefully these panelists are, are ready for what I'm about to throw them. Um, keep the questions coming. Um, we likely won't get to all of them, but I really want to encourage you to ask them because we're going to save them and then hopefully get back to you um, after the event as well. So this first question, I think, goes to Mark. Uh, Mark, how do you decide on the appropriate size of a jam or large wood structure for a given location? And that can be for Mark or Bruce, whoever wants to take that. That's a great question. I think all of us will have something to add, but I'll take the first step. So when we think about large wood, we really think about key pieces, which are pieces that are going to be stable over time and across different flows. So on a tributary like Sixes Creek or Boulder Creek, you could have a key piece that's one and a half to two times the active channel width versus on a bigger river like the Salmon River, which probably has a bankful width of over 100 feet. 
a key piece historically would be a dug fir or a cedar that probably is five feet in diameter and a full length of tree. Obviously, we don't have access to those. So in larger stream systems, we rely on engineering principles and we try to overcome drag, buoyancy and shear by keying that piece of wood into the stream bank and then adding boulders for ballast. Anybody else wanna to add to that? I'll jump in a little bit too, Mark. Um, on larger channels like the Salmon River, um, the river just has a lot of energy and it, and we don't, as Mark said, we don't have size of trees that would be stable in that river. So in addition to using engineering calculations to, to withstand the drag forces, and we also look at um, what the maximum scour depths are, are on the river, and we bury these jams or found the jams to below the maximum scour depth, and which on the Salmon River is about eight feet. So the wood jams that you'll see that we have constructed, there's actually a lot more wood that's actually underground that forms the superstructure of that jam. So typically to build a stable jam on the size of the Salmon River, we'll be using 35 to 40 trees that are two foot in diameter. Awesome. We have gotten a ton of questions about beavers. So I'm gonna just try and wrap it up into one for any of you guys. What has kind of the beaver response been to some of our restoration projects, particularly on Still Creek? I can sort of speak to that a little bit. So we don't see a lot of beaver activity um, on Still Creek. And actually there have been a couple of efforts in the past, I believe by ODFW, but it was before my time with the Forest Service where they tried to reintroduce some beavers on Still Creek. My understanding is that there's so much mountain lion activity in the area that they pretty frequently just don't make it long enough to have a sort of reproducing population of beavers. Um, so that's kind of my short and quick answer on it. There's probably more to it than that, but that's what I have kind of heard through the grapevine. Wild speculation, that could be it. Cool. Does anyone want to add anything to that before I jump to the next one? Yeah, in the Salmon River, we've seen a similar reaction. Uh, we have beavers that show up in the side channels. And a lot of times they add complexity to those side channel habitats by constructing dams and you know building some great pool habitat. And so we'll see them show up for a while and then they'll disappear. So we think it might very well be related to mountain lion predation. Um, one of the other projects we've done on the Salmon River is in the Wildwood Park area, and we reconnected river flows to the wetland that's uh, the Boardwalk Wetland or Sixes Creek Wetland, and there's beavers in that, that wetland, and we're really hoping that with the addition of river flows to that wetland, they'll really build a larger series of dams that will pr produce some really quality pool habitat for coho rearing. Awesome. This next question is for you, Bruce. In the figure that compared the 2014 and 2017 flow paths along the Salmon River, was there any floodplain grading involved in that project in particular? In there, that particular project, there was because that was actually part of um, some area that was disturbed by historic quarry operations. And there was a lot of quarry fill that was placed in the floodplain of the river. So we actually had to remove a lot of that uh, non-native fill to be able to reconnect up that side channel habitat complex. Awesome, thanks. Uh, Daniel or Bruce, uh, how do we actually monitor fish response? And in particular, what are some of our coho counts? Um, are we doing pit tagging? What are their survival rates and, and how? Oh, Bruce, I think I'll kick this one to you. Well, that's a great question. Um, the partners are monitoring coho primarily through uh, red surveys. So we count the number of adult fish that are using the side channel habitats that we reconnected up. We have also done some juvenile snorkel surveys in the side channel habitat. So we have a good idea of the rearing densities of the juveniles in the side channels. Um, we don't have any specific survival um, estimates. But the other big thing the partners are doing are running smolt traps, which um, are rotary screw traps that are out in the main channel of the river during the spring out, out migration period. 
and they sample a, a pop, a proportion of the fish that are out migrating and we can statistically come up with an estimate of the number of smolts that are leaving. And so that those are our main monitoring efforts right now. I wanna to touch on that real quick too. Um, particularly, the, particularly the smolt trapping part of it, just because um, we do run many smolt traps. We partner with ODFW, obviously me, the Forest Service, and then the Portland Water Bureau. And by running smolt traps, we actually cover something like 80 to 90% of the production of smolts in the entire basin. And obviously we don't capture all of them, but like Bruce said, we capture a portion of them. We mark them with a little clip or a little tattoo that we give them. And then we're able to figure out how many, um, we use some statistics and we figure out how many fish um, are in the basin or out migrating from the basin. We don't do any kind of permanent marking on them. Um, so we don't, uh, we don't put in pit tags. Uh, we don't put in any other sort of tag. Um, so we can't really tell which ones that we marked are coming back, but we at least know in the short term how many smolts we are producing. Awesome, Matt, this next one is for you. Perhaps you can touch upon the great amount of siltation and sediment that's been happening in the Sandy this past fall. So I saw that question and I specifically requested to answer it. Um, <laughs> because uh, it's something that we've been speculating on a lot. Um, so I, the Sandy in particular, it's always Sandy and it's kind of hard to tell um, if it's so much more, or so much less. The Zigzag River on the other hand, which is like I said, one of the big tribs, we have noticed so much more uh, sand and sediment that has just hung around um, way late into the season. And it, it's really, really abnormal. Um, and so my speculation is that a lot of that sediment is coming from the Zigzag River. Um, and why that's happening, we've kind of had a lot of internal talks um, and we're kind of guessing it has to do with glacial retreat and opening up new areas for some of the headwaters to, uh, to kind of erode. If anybody's been up around like Timberline, you've probably seen it's very, very sandy. Um, one of the tributaries is called Sand, Can or Sand River, which goes into Sand Canyon. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity for sand to kind of come down and wash out into the river. So that's our guess is that we're getting Again, glacial retreat, more areas exposed, and maybe some kind of big event happened up there. Um, I've been meaning to check it out, but it's become winter, and so I can't get up there now. Um, but yeah, that's that's best guess right now. Awesome, thanks, Matt. Daniel, was the monitoring that you all have done conducted voluntarily, or was a monitoring plan built into the original recovery plan kind of on the onset of it? To my knowledge, it was built into all the proposals, but those predate me by a couple of years. I feel like Mark's gonna have a slightly more robust answer to that than I will. Mark, do you have anything to add to that? So we don't have any regulatory requirements to do monitoring. We do it based on um, providing information to our funders on project effectiveness, as well as we discussed earlier, the Sandy partners have a goal of restoring salmon steelhead at the basin scale. So this basically by monitoring fish response, we can adaptively manage our restoration plan and see if it's on the right trajectory. And if it's not, we can tweak it. And if it's working well, then we can apply those same techniques to uh, new surroundings. Awesome. While we're on the topic of, of monitoring, have we investigated how water temperature has responded to this restoration work? maybe Daniel or Mark or any of y'all. We're currently doing a water temperature study on restored side channels with the BLM and Forest Service on a number of the systems, particularly Stowe Creek and Salmon River, where we're measuring if reactivating floodplains and off-channel habitats leads to cooling of the main stem river. So right now we've got thermistors out and we're measuring water temperature at side channel inlets, side channel outlets, and then the main stem water temperature. And once we uh, analyze that data, we'll have a better idea of what kind of impacts we're having on water temperature. Daniel, this one's for you. What type of metrics are you using to demonstrate complexity and connectivity? Are metrics different between main stems and side channels? And what flow events are you using for measurement? So that was a lot. Feel free to pitch one of those three questions to any of your colleagues. I'll try and get to all of those. Um, so a lot of the metrics that we're, we're looking for um, 
can be gotten through uh, the level two freshwater inventory survey, um, which is doing things like looking at things like wetted width, um, average residual pool depth, um, substrate composition, um, gradient, and, and a lot of other kind of physical factors. And then once we've gotten that data, we'll bring it back into the office and we'll look at things like, uh, you know, what's the density of pools? How many, how many of them do we have, uh, you know, per reach? And we can look at that uh, through time. And we can also use that to kind of um, assess how they're changing um, and if they're getting more or less complex. Um, and you said uh, there was something about the flow. I missed the flow part at the end. Yeah, are you monitoring or tracking uh, flow events, you know, in relation to how you guys are monitoring the overall project? Yeah, so we'll usually go in and repeat some of our channel surveys after a bank full event. Um, and then we are kind of waiting for a really large flow event to go through some of these systems so we can see how they respond with all this new wood in them. Um, we are also doing um, some discharge monitoring in our side channels, uh, particularly in up in the Clear Fork River. Um, we are taking some, some measurements sort of like at the, the top and bottom of our project reaches uh, to see, you know, if the flow is pretty consistent through it, how much is uh, dropping into groundwater, um, how much is being diverted proportionally in each of the side channels. Um, and we can look at that usually three or four times a year. Um, Matt, in side channels, are you modeling hydraulics to demonstrate change following wood introduction? Am I modeling hydraulics to demonstrate change? Okay, so this is, I will say I'm relatively new to the modeling world and the models that I showed you earlier were actually done by a separate engineer. I'm learning about this stuff right now, however. Um, and we're trying to figure out how to model wood. And that's something that's really, really difficult because there's multiple ways that you can do it. Um, I think I saw another question in there where somebody asked about, you know, are we changing the, roughness coefficient, which is basically how well, or how, how slow does the surface make the water go? Um, are we modeling the terrain? Um, for people who don't know hydraulic modeling, um, basically you have lots of options for how you can do this. And we're still looking on kind of figuring out the best way to model wood and to see how it changes. And so whoever asked that question, if you would like to contact me and talk to me, um, I would love to hear if you have any kind of specific thoughts on it as well. Um, because wood does add a whole new level of complexity that the modeling program that we use, HECRAS, um, does not necessarily have built into uh, the program. So that's my kind of non-answer for you. Nice. Thanks, Matt. Um, Mark, can you explain more about what goes into the planning of these restoration projects? How many years in advance does planning begin? The initial basin scale planning we did over several years in the late 2000s, and that's where we really came together as a group and prioritized uh, sub watersheds where we wanted to focus our restoration. We did that, as I said earlier, based on current strongholds of fish. Um, that's based on the foundations of conservation biology, where it's a lot easier to build off existing populations and expand their range than to go into a subwatershed that has really reduced populations and hope to see that response. Awesome. Bruce, I think this one is for you. Where do we get all of this large wood? Is it from logged areas or down trees? That's a great question because it's probably one of our most vexing problems in, in restoring rivers. You would think wood would be highly available on the Forest Service and BLM, but um, most of the land uses um, make it difficult for us to get wood. So we, we get it in a number of different ways. The Forest Service has had several um, areas where we specifically identified timber sales for the wood to go to restoration. Sometimes we get wood from hazard tree removal or windfall, windstorms that blow down a lot of wood. For a long time, the BLM was getting wood for the Lower Salmon River project from the Horning Seed Orchard near Estacada as the, the, the plantations of trees that were originally planted to produce seed crops as those trees became essentially too tall to use to efficiently harvest the seed the orchard was actually trying to figure out how to remove them and we just said hey we'll go in and take those trees for free um, we'll remove them and and you won't even know that they were there so that there's a number of places where we get them sometimes we uh, contract with private 
uh, timber farm owners and buy wood. Freshwater Trust has done that somewhat. So there's just a, wherever we can find trees, we're after them. And then just to add that, our preferred method is to find live trees that are standing and then tipping them over with an excavator so we can have the whole tree and the root fan. And that adds up to be a significant part of the restoration cost, the actual acquiring trees and then hauling them to a restoration site. Right. can you explain a little bit why that root is so important? The root is really important for a couple reasons. The primary, well, I guess it's not primary, two reasons. One is that it really adds stability. It's a lot harder for the stream to move a piece of wood downstream if it has that root fan attached. It really acts as an anchor. And then additionally, um, it adds a lot of uh, complexity to the stream channel. If you have a root fan down in a pool and you're doing a snorkel survey for juvenile fish, they are all just kegged around all those little tiny nooks and crannies that that root fan provides. Awesome. So we are obviously seeing tremendous loss of fish at sea. So how does that correlate to returns that you guys are seeing, you know, over the years? This is for any of you guys. I'll, I'll start off a little bit with that. Um, in the mid to 2010s, about 2015 through 2017, we had what was termed the blob, a huge area of warm water in the North Pacific that greatly decreased survival of juvenile salmon out in the ocean. And that's why um, some of the return numbers that we were showing, um, adult response and smoke production, pretty amazing because those increases in freshwater production have occurred during a time period when ocean survival was really low. And it's if we could have both good ocean conditions at the same time of increasing freshwater pr production and survival, I think we could really increase uh, salmon and steelhead stocks in the Sandy Basin. And it, it just, you know, there's salmon and steelhead life cycle is complex. They'll, they'll rear in fresh water for one to three years and then go to the ocean for generally two to three years. So they use a lot of habitat, both estuarine, open ocean, and then freshwater habitat. So they're really dependent on a large amount of habitat that we've had effects to as uh, from human development and human uses. So um, it's it's kind of a credit to the efforts of the partnership that we actually are increasing fish numbers during a time period when ocean conditions have really been poor for salmon and steelhead. Yeah, just to add to that, it's interesting that over the last decade, as Bruce pointed out, the Sandy has typically been an outlier in that where, where many runs up and down the coast are declining, the Sandy has been steadily seeing increases in fish. And I think that really speaks to this basin scale applied restoration approach. And then it also speaks to uh, the impacts of PGE's decision to take out Marmot Little Sandy Dams. Great. Do we have any specific goals for fish propagation and return that we're shooting for? And if so, in what time frame in particular are we looking for that specific return? And maybe as a follow-up, Daniel, how do we continue to measure that and how often will we measure that? I'm pitching you guys some hard ones here. I Matt. will start to say something. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as far as goals for the specific number of fish, I think it's a little bit hard to put a specific number on exactly what we want because the Sandy is one basin out of many in a very big world with changing ocean conditions and what runs looked like 100 years ago, we're probably never going to get quite back to that point. Um, so I, I don't know that I have a specific number. Maybe Mark or Bruce have something that they'd like to say to that. Um, but as far as time frame goes, um, I would say that a lot of the work that we do is what we call process-based restoration. It's what Bruce was talking about a little bit earlier. And so it's not just doing things right now, it's doing things that are focused on how the river responds in the long term. Um, and so, yeah, there's immediate benefits, but then we also do things like planting trees or protecting riparian areas that in 100 or 200 years, 
that'll be new old growth. And that'll be stuff that eventually falls into the river and makes its own wood, you know, or it has its own large wood recruitment. And so the timeline, there's an immediate timeline where, yeah, fish are threatened and we need to, uh, or salmon are threatened and we need to have kind of a short-term uh, improvement, but also we really are looking at the long-term um, for, for what's gonna happen to this basin. And then I would just add to that, that I think our initial target or benchmark is to hit the abundances set in the recovery plan for lower Columbia River salmon and steelhead. And we're pretty close to hitting those for spring Chinook and winter steelhead. Coho aren't responding well. And part of that is the challenges of getting water up onto floodplains. Um, and then once we can consistently hit those abundance targets, we'd like to hit some of those higher broad sense recovery targets. So people can enjoy all of the benefits that salmon and steelhead provide and not just long-term persistence, which is really what the abundance in the recovery plan shoots for. Great. Mark and Daniel, how do we choose the streams or the reaches that we want to work on? I can start. We have um, we have a full kind of prioritized list of all the different sub basins in the Sandy watershed, um, and so we've been sort of steadily working our way down that list. Um, so the I believe it's the main stem Sandy and the Salmon are, are one and two. Still Creek is three, um, and having wrapped up on Still Creek, we're now starting to move in um, to I think the Zigzag Clear Fork, um, and other reaches of the Salmon, um, which are ranked a little bit lower, and uh, they're places that you know we expect to be able to get the best response. And that's all kind of based on that initial prioritization that was done uh, with the ecosystem diagno diagnosis and treatment tool, so EDT, um, back in the 90s, um, when we first kind of came up with this um, prioritization. And Mark, if you want to add to that, I'm sure I missed something. Yeah, just to add to what Daniel said, so we do have the overarching prioritization, which ranks all of the streams from highest priority to lowest priority. And then when we enter a new system, for example, um, a couple of years ago, we started doing work on Sixes Creek. What we did is we look at the existing habitat conditions. And since we knew large wood was a controlling variable on Sixes Creek, we went out there, we measured current large wood abundance. We then did quite a bit of uh, analytical work with our partners and identified what the historical reference condition should be for amount of pieces in Stowe Creek. And then that difference became a restoration target. So we basically started treating reaches on Sixes Creek to hit that limiting factor of large wood, and then we'll monitor fish in the habitat conditions in response to that to see if additional actions are necessary. Do we have any work planned for the Delta? You know, our work right now is focused on the Upper Sandy, but there's other Sandy River Basin partners that are working down on the Delta. The Forest Service is working down on the Delta, as is the Sandy Basin Watershed Council. Awesome. Matt, can you talk a little bit about the other partners who might be involved in this project? You know, other contractors maybe that we use, you know, what does the partnership look like? Yeah, sure. Um, so, well, obviously the Sandy River Basin partners as a whole, which you kind of introduced a little bit earlier, um, but contractors. So we try to use uh, local contractors for the most part. So we've worked extensively in the past with um, O'Malley Brothers who are based, based out of Estacada. And then Aquatic Contracting Inc. does a lot of our in-water work. Um, and they're I think based in Portland or somewhere in the Portland metro area. Um, so yeah, we, we have kind of a really, really great long-term relationship with aquatic contracting and they've done excellent work for us. Um, let's see, we also uh, have a lot of volunteers that we rely on from year to year, particularly for doing things like, um, like uh, riparian plantings or invasive species removal or campsite decommissioning or anything like that. And um, in the past, we've had the Sandy River Watershed Council work with us. We've had uh, Mazamas. One of the ones I really want to call out are Wilderness Volunteers, which is a national group that will come out and they'll spend like a week with us every single year. Um, and they send people all over the country. We're just one of many projects, but they'll spend a week with us and they'll usually do a lot of the kind of like mop-up work after our restoration sites. 
so you know we like to make sure everything is all pretty you know we have native vegetation planted and we we didn't introduce any invasive and we have erosion controls in place for where we did have to make disturbance and there there are the people that really really help us out with a lot of that work um unfortunately this year our volunteer situation has been a lot lower but we're pretty much non-existent because of covid um but we do rely heavily on volunteers so with that question i really want to give a call out to uh to our volunteers Awesome. Thanks, Matt. Daniel, how long will we continue to monitor our restoration sites? I think the plan is at least 10 years, but I think sort of regularly into the future, um, following major flow events, um, sort of indefinitely. There might be more concrete plans that I don't know of, um, but it's at least 10. It sort of depends on the funder where we're working, how long that work has been going on for. Um, a lot of our large wood placement uh, projects, you know, they sort of mandate five years and then we'll usually go back and visit them anyway um, for longer periods of time. So there are sort of hard cutoffs and soft cutoffs. The next question is still for you. Um, can you explain a little bit more about how functional linear feet is calculated? Oh yeah, so that's, um, functional linear feet is, it's a pretty ambitious model. It's essentially, it boils down to a very wildly complicated Excel spreadsheet. Um, and it's basically broken down into, um, there's sort of a, a field surveying component um, and a, an office analysis component. And what it's trying to get at is these sort of, there's these four uh, big functional groups. Um, there is a, hydro, a hydro, hydrologic function group, um, a geomorphic function group, a biological function group, and a water quality function group. Um, and there's basically a kind of a mix of, um, Oh, sampling methods to try and just get a, a rapid idea of each of those main things, because um, each of those functions are broken down into to four or five different metrics. Um, and I saw there was kind of a follow up to that about you know which which aspects of that were the um, you know the main driver behind our our, our numbers, um, and it's really the side channel length and the large wood. Two are the things that are really going to change um, before and after a project. Um, the model also takes into consideration things like the, the floodplain height and the, you know, the floodplain bedrock composition and all this other stuff um, that is really, there's a lot of landscape, mail, uh, landscape scale metrics um, that go into that model that, you know, aren't going to change too much, but we're, we're interested in the parts that we can change um, and that we can have sort of a before and after look. So the numbers that we showed earlier um, aren't the total functional linear feet available. They are the difference that we've been able to make uh, with our projects. I hope that answers it. It's, it's you can really go into the weeds with this stuff a bit, and if um, you want to ask me more about it, I'm more than happy to chat about it. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, so this is for all of our panelists. Um, I love this question. Um, thank you, Kevin. What are some of the primary perceived negatives of all of this work? Right. We've talked about the outcomes and a lot of the positive. What are some of the things that you guys struggle with um, with just seeing kind of in implementing some of these projects? I'll go first. So I think some of the biggest negative impacts are short-term disturbances to riparian and stream channels. We are building a lot of these projects with tracked excavators, off-road dump trucks. So during that six-week construction season, it looks a lot like a job site. Obviously, we have best management practices that are developed at a regional basis that tells us what we can and can't do and are designed to protect um, aquatic resources with riparian. But when we're in there, it's loud, it's dusty, and uh, it definitely has a negative impact on vegetation. The good news is on working on the west side of Mount Hood is how quickly riparian areas recover. So we can in be in there and we'll have a lot of excavation. We'll restore side channel like Matt was showing you. We'll have ingress and egress routes in and out of the site. And in a couple or three years, especially after we have a couple of high water events, our goal and what we've seen is you can walk out to these side channels and not even know that it was restored by us. It basically looks like a naturally functioning feature on the environment. Yeah, and I'd like to just kind of build off of that a little bit. Um, and I don't necessarily view what I'm gonna say as a negative, but I think that some people do view it as a negative is that, um, a lot of people, when they think of a, a stream, they think of kind of that picture that Mark showed at the beginning of his presentation of 
the Salmon River flowing under the bridge at Wildwood, where there's just not a lot going on, but it's just this kind of like neat, tidy stream. What I view as a beautiful stream is something that has a lot of large wood in it, a lot of complexity and, and fish everywhere. Um, but you do kind of need to have a change of reference of what you're looking for. Um, I know sometimes when we're doing projects, we think a lot about um, kind of the, the visual aspect of it. Um, how will cabin owners see the project or how will people um, who are you know hiking through the area see it or fishermen or boaters or you, know, you have to kind of think a little bit about those things because um, yeah, because not everybody views large wood in the stream as a, uh, a positive. Um, so yeah, just changing kind of your perception, I guess, of what a stream looks like. And then one last negative before I let Bruce or Daniel answer is that a lot of uh, invasive plants um, are very adept at colonizing disturbed riparian areas. So it's something that we really pay attention to. We have heavy equipment operators um, power wash, clean their equipment before they come in to make sure we're not bringing in invasives from outside the basin. But there's even a number of weeds in the sandy basin that'll start colonizing sites once we've disturbed them. So it's something where we work with other partners who are focused on treating weeds. And then as well, we go out and treat those weeds and really try to make sure the natives are coming. So places aren't overrun by things like scotch broom or reed canary grass. Kind of just to jump in on some of the stuff that Matt and Mark were talking about is we have a really short time frame where we have an in-water work period on the Salmon River and many of these other streams. We only have six weeks to accomplish these, these projects. And so that really condenses this work into a really short time frame. And and you really feel the pressure to get it done because you're you've lined up the work and you've done all the planning and you really want to pull it off right and and you know that you're going to have great benefits to the system and to the fish that depend on it and so there's there's some stress involved in trying to get a project in in and uh, i think it's you know it's just part of it but um i think that's kind of a negative it's, it's just it's it can be stressful and also kind of the short-term impacts that Mark was talking about. It is a construction site and you try to minimize those as best as possible. And so those are all happening at once when you're, when you're, when you're building things. Awesome, thanks guys. Bruce, I think this next one would be for you. Are there desired future large wood projects that have been cost prohibitive to date, but that would really complement this work that we know we wanna engage in? Um, yeah, we're, we're looking at the Sandy River, which is even, you know, big and more big and powerful than the salmon. And so far, a lot of those ideas that we have, um, uh, that'd be hard to pull off. They're, they're pretty expensive projects. Um, that's the first thing that comes to mind to me. Um, just that also the scope and the scale of working on a watershed scale, um, it's, it's tough to, to fund this work. I think Mark mentioned over $7 million of work so far in the past decade. And so um, just in general, we're, we're, we take a, a bite off at a time, but we still have quite a ways to go. Um, Mark, you've obviously seen the basin change a lot. So Mark has been with the Freshwater Trust for 20 years now. Obviously, you've seen a lot change. What can you expect in the next 20 years? Not suggesting that you'll be at TFT for the next 20 years, but what do you expect to see? You know, in the upper Sandy where we're working, we have a long-term target of having all applied restoration actions completed in the next 10 to 12 years, which will cost somewhere around $15 million. So if we're successful in raising that money in 12 years, if we've completed all applied restoration actions, and then give that another eight to 10 years of passive restoration, working on all this large wood and on the floodplain, I really expect that we can have a fully restored upper Sandy. That's where it needs to be to hit those recovery targets. Awesome. Uh, I love this question and I'll pitch it to you, Daniel. Are we doing similar work on other rivers in Oregon? 
Uh, yeah, we're doing uh, this sort of physical habitat work, um, not just around the sand, we have similar projects um, down in the Rogue Basin. Um, we've done a lot of side channel reconnection and large wood placement down there, um, which has been kind of met with different challenges because they're usually in uh, kind of urban streams where there's a lot more people like living in the watershed right next to these projects. Um, we actually just had another uh, webinar about that last week, which is on our website, if folks want to learn more about that. Um, we also do um, riparian planting projects all across Oregon, which is really focused on um, temperature reduction in streams as part of our water quality trading program. Um, and those, those are the two really big ones. Um, but if you're looking for sort of like the large wood placement type work, uh, the really physical stuff, um, you know, the other big hotspot is definitely the road. Awesome. Thanks guys. Well, some of these other questions are a little bit more technical in nature. So what I would love for you to do is if your specific technical question has not been answered in this session, I would love for you to email it to caroline at caroline at the freshwatertrust.org. And we're going to pass it along to one of our presenters or another member of the Freshwater Trust team to just really kind of take care of and, and make sure that you're getting your technical question answered. And we'll also pass it along to Matt or Bruce as well. I want to thank everybody for joining us this evening, especially our panelists. We're really, really fortunate to have a number of really great partners that help us make this work happen. But I would really encourage you, if you've been inspired by the outcomes that you've seen tonight and a lot of the results, to consider to give to the Freshwater Trust. Right now, philanthropy is really the catalyst for all of this work. Clearly, grants and partnerships and contracts really go into it, but philanthropy is kind of what propels all of this to happen. So if you're inspired, please go to the freshwatertrust.org to consider to give a gift tonight and follow us on all of our social media channels. And like I said, you can feel free to send one of those technical questions over to Caroline and we'll be sure to get it answered. Thank you guys so much for joining us. We really appreciate it.